I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear My mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear The thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. After relocating to Manchester from their home in Hereford, Lucy's parents, John 77 and Susan 63, both attended her murder trial every day for 10 months. That's almost a year. After she was convicted in a show of solidarity, neither attended her sentencing where the victim statements of parents who had lost their babies were read. And of course, Lucy didn't attend either. There is something quite poignant in being at the center of a case like this and seemingly only wanting to hear their precious daughter's version of events. I think that tells you where the guile to commit these crimes came from. A friend told the Times, quote, Her parents used to think butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. She's literally the last person anybody would suspect as a killer, end quote. Well, I don't think it's a case of used to think. We know at a hearing at the hospital held in order to hold other doctors accountable and you know, get them to apologize, Lucy's own father was present to read out a statement she'd written. Think about that. Lucy was in her mid-twenties, about 26 years old, and her parents are right there with her, ensconced in a human resources scenario at Lucy's place of work. They're arguing with her employees and colleagues. When she was arrested, he was there, her father was there to make up her bed, while her mother Susan screamed at police, I did it, take me instead. And that arrest was on July 3rd, 2018. We're now five years later, and when she's convicted in court, her mother is still saying, you can't be serious. This can't be right. The key word here is denial. And so if you're in denial, what can happen? Well, what is denial? It's denial of reality. It's not facing what is happening around you. And so certain uh, mainstream media are starting to kind of acknowledge with this nurse now exposed as Britain's worst child killer of modern times. I think it's the Daily Mail said, attention is now understandably being paid to her upbringing. And whether you have reservations about that or not, what I want you to try and do is just push that aside and just open your mind, open your heart as well, just to this idea of let, what happens when we do examine Lucy's upbringing. When you just open our minds and we think, what, where can this possibly take us in terms of insight not so much into her psychology, but into the practical dynamics of being brought up in a certain way. And you're going to see the result of that when you simply explore this is quite astonishing. But before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Welcome to the thousands of you who have subscribed in the last couple of days. Bear in mind, those interested in the Long Island serial killer case, I'm going to be doing a a kind of a deep dive, but looking at his statements and also his body language, it's something I don't often do, and I think it is very overdue in this particular case, and so look out for that. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button, and let's get started. Now, in serial killers, there are formulas and patterns, well-worn psychological paths and strategies. In, in terms of serial killers, Lucy Letby is, is unusual. She's unusual in some ways, but not always. Uh, there's sadism here and an unusual need to control, as we see in other serial killers. She's cruel and sadistic, but the roots of her sadism are clearly different. For example, unlike many serial killers, she grew up in a what appears to be a loving home. Also, Female serial killers form less than 10% of the total serial killers in the USA. The number is even lower, 7% of serial killers in England and Wales are women. 
If we compare 26-year-old neonatal nurse Lucy Letby to 59-year-old Manhattan architect Rex Heuerman, Letby may have murdered and tried to murder twice or even three times as many babies than Heuerman's victims. So what really are the roots of sadism in her case? We'll get to that in due course. I mean, we'll really grab that bull by the horns in due case, not in this analysis, but soon. But first, we want to get to know this this loving home life, you know, this environment where she was born and raised. What did it look like? What did it feel like? What was it like? What was that experience like for Lucy? Now, according to the Daily Mail, retail boss John and Susan, an accounts clerk, fairly simple people, raised Letby as an only child in a 1930s semi-detached home in a cul-de-sac. Now, once again, proving how unique and exceptional Lucy is in terms of the general profile, the data seems to show that middle or eldest children are twice as likely to be serial killers than an only child or the youngest child. So already we have at least two anomalies. The first is that she's a female serial killer. And then the second is that she's a she's an only child in a loving home. The first two don't really match the formula, do they? And so we've got to look at what's going on in the third dimension. And the third dimension here is the loving home. According to the Daily Mail, uh, Lucy's parents still live in the same house, which they bought shortly after their marriage. They also holiday in Turkey three times a year, and each time they take Lucy with them. And they did this right up until she was arrested in July 2018. According to the article, nothing suggests that Mr. and Mrs. Letby were anything but caring parents who showered their daughter with love from the moment she was born, five months after they married in July 1989. Her parents also helped Lucy buy her first home, which is a three-bedroom home worth £179,000 in Westburn Road, Blackon. She bought that on April 6, 2016. Now, I wouldn't say nothing suggests they were anything but caring, because if you think about it, Lucy herself didn't describe her folks as massively caring, but rather massively worried. There's an important difference there. Now, this is a text that Lucy sent to a friend of hers. She said, My parents worry massively about everything and anything, hate that I live alone, etc. These are your words. I feel bad because I know it's really hard for them, especially as I'm an only child. And they mean well, just a little suffocating at times, and I constantly feel guilty. So she even brings up that reference to her being an only child, knowing how big an issue that is. I know what you're thinking. But you're wrong. You might say you have overprotective parents or that you're an overprotective parent yourself and it's never done any harm. I don't know anything about that, but what I do know is Lucy isn't talking about normal or average overprotection. It's extreme. It's okay to worry about certain things and certainly for fathers to sometimes be overprotective of their daughters. I know mine is. It's different when both parents are overprotective towards a single only child and the only child actually experiences this in her own words as suffocating. These are your words. She's not saying her parents' attention is too much. She's not saying that it's excessive. She's saying it's suffocating. That's a symbolic way of saying they are killing her with kindness. They are ruining her life by squeezing the oxygen out of it, by by being constantly in it, effectively constantly interfering. Let's read that again. They worry massively about everything and anything. It's really hard for them, especially as I'm an only child. She doesn't say it's quite hard for them. She says it's really hard. It's easy to read those words and take them at face value and imagine it's not really different to your situation or my situation or perhaps the average situation. But that's because we lack the imagination, not so much the ability to imagine, but practicing, using our imaginations. 
We, we lack that ability to see Lucy's world through her eyes and her experience. And obviously, we can't do that if we playing judge and decide and, and kind of pointing a finger at her and saying how evil she is. Not that that's not true, but you're putting yourself in the way, and that's why you can't see who she is, certainly if you're trying to understand what's going on here. According to the Daily Mail, Lucy had a part-time job at WH Smith in the city, and her parents were immensely proud when she became the first in their family to go to university. Was that the case in your family? Were you the first in your family to go to university? Were you the first in your family to do anything? Back to the Daily Mail, when she attained her honours degree, they marked her graduation. Her parents marked her graduation in December 2011, that's 12 years ago now, with an announcement in their local paper, the Hereford Times. Did your parents do that for you? The Daily Mail says, you know, alongside a picture of her wearing a mortarboard and clutching her degree certificate, they wrote, uh, let be Lucy, BSc Honours in Child Nursing. We are so proud of you. After all your hard work, love mum and dad. And you kind of get get the idea that her mum must have placed that ad if the word mum appears first. Just a, just a thought there. Now, a similar announcement with an accompanying photograph of Lucy as a young child was also placed in the same newspaper to mark her 21st birthday. So although she's 21 years old, they put a picture of her as a, a little little girl in the newspaper. Did your parents do that for you as well? You begin. You're special. You have a very special purpose. She's been raised to believe she's the princess or a queen in her own universe. And whenever she has a need or a crisis, her parents are right there like a pair of doting chickens clucking protectively over their only chick, fussing and flapping. But what happens if you are told, brought up, reminded, basically programmed that, that you're special, you've got a very special purpose, you're here for a reason, and then when you go out into the world, well, the, the, the world is a little bit of a colder, emptier place than the cocoon at home. Your parents love you unconditionally, but when you reach out to someone that you like, well, they don't perhaps seem to like you, or they seem to attach conditions. And, and you find yourself asking, why is life so much harder outside of that cocoon? Even the Daily Mail says, having been at the center of her parents' universe for so long, she craved the attention she had received since childhood, and once she was living away from them, needed to find it elsewhere. Very well put. And since the world didn't automatically feel she deserved to be loved and doted on like her parents did, she had to invent contrivances and crises in order to manipulate, to trick the world into paying attention to her. She likely realized whenever a baby in her care struggled, she became the center of the universe again. And when she could summon a doctor by playing with feces, and by that I mean essentially using the deaths of babies as a sort of doorbell, turning the people around her back into toys, well, suddenly she had the control of her world back, the world that she once took for granted in her own home. And it felt good. It felt so good. There was such a surge of warmth and familiar fuzziness. It was a feeling that she needed. She felt she had to do it again. According to the article, other text messages sent throughout her murderous spree reveal how she sought sympathy and admiration from colleagues. After the death of her first victim, Baby A, in June 2015, a fellow nurse sent her a message which read, I hope you are okay. You were brilliant. Lucy responded, That was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Just a big shock for us all. Hard coming in tonight and seeing the parents. End quote. I hope through this analysis, the true psychology at work here is starting to crystallize, starting to sharpen in your mind and become even clearer than it's been so far. Even so, I've still not touched on the central, the core dynamic that is fueling her sadism. Do you know what it is? 
Which brings us at last to the moment of truth wherein the fundamental flaw is ultimately expressed and the anomaly revealed. In the next episode, we'll deal with the number one clue we all missed. And here's a hint. In June 2015, Lucy returned to Ash House and then moved into her home in Westburn Road, Blackon, on April 6, 2016. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.